It's the waiver wire. It's where players are available for you to add to your fantasy teams, or when you drop them, it's where they go. Michael Bolton. Thanks, Josh. It's Michael Bolton here, and it's time for another episode of the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast. Let's get to it. Let's get to it, indeed. You are Locked On Fantasy Basketball, your daily fantasy basketball podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast, brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd, and do you think that the sale of hats in Turkey has increased or decreased in recent times? I'm also the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com, and you can find me on Twitter as always, at RedRock underscore B-Ball, on TikTok at RedRock underscore B-Ball, and on Instagram at Locked On Fantasy Basketball. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. Thank you also for making Locked On Fantasy Basketball your first listen every day. We're free. We're available on all platforms. All right, let's uh, let's talk waiver wire. Before we do that, though, you know what I'm going to do? Like, all right, so do you want to go just sidebar completely? Uh, yeah, I've got a. a we started collecting some uh, baseball hats recently, and my son is a San Diego Padres fan, as you, you probably know. Uh, we're going to be heading over to a, to a Padres game in July, so we're going to be doing that. And then I just started collecting hats, but I didn't even know, right? So I, I bought like uh, an El Paso Chihuahuas hat because my dog's a Chihuahua, so a Chihuahua's a pretty cool logo. So I got the Chihuahuas hat. Um, got actually two Chihuahuas hat from the El Paso Chihuahuas and when they had the uh, rebranding to the El Paso Margaritas, which is the Padres AAA affiliate. I know you don't care about this, but I'm getting it off my chest. Then I saw another hat that I liked, the um, Lake Elsinore Storm hat, which looks sick. Then I realized that they're like a high A affiliate of the Padres. I went, wow, I didn't realize I had that. And now my son's like, go get this one. It's the Flying Chunklers of the San Antonio Mission. So I'm making it a... a a mission of mine now, mission, pun unintended, to collect all the minor league affiliate hats from the San Diego Padres. So I've got to get the um, uh, the mission slash the flying chunklers, and I've got to go get myself the uh, the Fort Wayne, was it the tin cup, tin caps? Yeah, tin caps. The Fort Wayne tin caps with that logo of the apple, one of the sickest logos ever. So there you go. Um, complete, I'm just, because I'm looking at the Chihuahuas hat in front of me now, and just thought that it all tied in, but you don't care, because we're talking waiver wire. So let's talk waiver wire right now. Again, this show is more focused for the rest of the year. There are 19 days left in the NBA season. 19 days left in the NBA season. So this, again, leads into Roto, leads into uh, situations where you're not aggressively streaming games in on a day-by-day basis, which we talk about every day anyway. Um, But just quickly, if you are in a Roto League, I did tweet this out. There are 17 game days left. There's 19 days left in the season, right? There are 17 game days left in the NBA season because there are two days left with zero games on. So you need to have a look at what your maximum games played is in your Roto League, because if you have got 17 or 16 games left to hit max, you've got to put someone in that slot every day. You you cannot, and there are games, there are days when there are two games on, like Thursday. You've got to get someone in that slot every single day, otherwise you will not reach your maximum. And in Roto, you have to reach that maximum. So go and have a look. Go and have a look at your pace. Go and have a look at your literal games left remaining for each slot. There are 17 game days left in the NBA season. 19 real days, 17 game days left. We're talking waiver wire. That was probably unnecessary for those of you still playing Roto. I'm still in a Roto league at the moment. And honestly, because I looked at it this morning, and one of my slots, I got 14 games left. And there's 17 days. I said, oh no, I've got to really be like, I've got to make sure that I don't even put anyone in that slot. That's even a game time decision that might get ruled out because otherwise I'm going to end up with no games and not enough opportunity to max out that spot. And in order for me to catch Mitch Casey in that league, I need to max out each slot. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about must roster guys. We are relatively ignoring schedule here because these are just guys I think you would plop in and start most days. And that's why the list is relatively marginal because again, at this point of the year, we want to be targeting what categories do we need What categories do we need to ignore? How do we match up against our head-to-head opponent in the playoffs? How do we deal with getting the specific categories in a Roto format as well? So I've got five names here on the category side for must roster who I just think probably should be on a roster. Scoot Anderson, yes, there will be bad games. But how many guys are you going to find off the waiver wire who every single night 
have potential for 25 and 10. He won't get 25 and 10 every night. That is not what I'm saying. He might have 15 and 7 with 20% shooting. That is distinctly possible. But how many blokes available on 43% of waiver wise? Remember, these roster percentage numbers can get a little bit skewed now because there'll be a lot of teams that are inactive because they're out of the playoffs also. If you're, don't, you're not in the playoffs, don't make waiver ads. Don't do it. What are you doing it for? Don't do it. But no one really available on the wire has got Let's say 30 and 10 potential, which Scoot has literally done this season. Um, I've got Trace Jackson Davis there as well. Yes, I know he is dealing with a knee injury. And if he does miss Wednesday's game, then we get into the situation where we go, well, probably don't want to hold through that absence. But when he is playing, to me, he is a must roster and I start him every game. Jalen Suggs, I think, is that guy. He has been very good most of the year. There's always the weird, here's a 21-minute game with four points out of nowhere. But as a general rule, I think Suggs is a must roster guy. I think Corey Kispert's a must roster guy. There's no Bilal Koulibaly. He is starting. He is annoying Kispert, but we are going to see blokes sitting on that team all the way through, I'm pretty sure. And then Trey Mann is the other one. I think I'm marginally leaning Mann over Misic. I don't think Ball's coming back. Martin's coming back. Curry's coming back. I don't think any of that's happening in Charlotte. So I think we look at Trey Mann. Just quickly talking about coming back. Mitch Robinson is coming back today. I do not think that he is 100% a must roster guy. I don't think that he takes over from Isaiah Hartenstein any point soon. I think he'd be relatively limited in terms of minutes, and we know what he does. He's field goals, rebounds, and blocks. That's all he does. He's a three-category player, and I don't think he's going to play 26 minutes. I think he's going to play 18 minutes here, get ramped up for the playoffs. It doesn't mean you drop Hartenstein, and I don't think that Robinson is a grab, especially in head-to-head. The other positive news is Don Mitchell is going to return at the end of the week. That probably means, well, it definitely means any chance of Isaac Okoro doing anything is done, and it reduces the value of Karis Levert pretty significantly. So that's the two injury return news things that we got. Also, we got Shea ruled out today as well. He said after the game, two, him and Dagnot both talked about a hip injury. So just watch that. They listed it as a quad problem. So there you go. Um, in points leagues, it's, oh, I forgot to do the bloody, the graphic. I forgot where I'm at here. Must roster graphic. There you go. How sensual is that? Uh, on points league side of things, it's the same names. Basically, I just don't have Jalen Suggs as that guy in a points league that I think that we have to consider as a must roster. I've got Trace, I've got Scooter, Kispert, and man, I think those are guys that we put on our rosters in a points league and we feel relatively comfortable about their role about their minutes, about their production as a general rule. And they're all available in 50 to 60%, uh, so 40 to 50% of leagues minimum, they're available in. Not going to be for everybody. For a lot of you, they'll be added, but a lot of you, they won't. So just, again, I'm trying to just cover all bases and make sure these guys are grabbed. Today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. Are you the kind of driver that likes to push things a little bit further? Do you ever wonder what adventure could be around the next corner? Well, Our friends, my good friends at Nissan, have a lineup of SUVs with their capabilities to take your adventure to the next level. The 2024 Nissan Rogue is perfect for city drives and great escapes. Class-exclusive Google built-in is your always updating assistant to call on for almost anything. Gone are the days of connecting your phone. Google Assistant, Google Maps, and the Google Play Store are built in to the 12.3-inch HD touchscreen infotainment system. The 2024 Rogue is the perfect mid-size crossover for your next adventure. Nissan's incredible lineup also includes the 2024 Nissan Pathfinder. It has room for up to eight, an expansive cargo capacity and advanced available 4x4 capability. With 284 horsepower and up to 6,000 pounds of towing, when adventure calls, the Pathfinder is there to answer. So take the Nissan Rogue, the Nissan Pathfinder, or the Nissan Armada and go and find your next big adventure. Shop NissanUSA.com or to translate it into American, NissanUSA.com. Okay, Um, if Nissan really wants to be referred to as one of my friends, like in a strong way, like best mates, they can just send me a car. Like That'd be cool. Send send me one of your uh, Nissan rogues. Then we'll really become best friends. All right, what are we looking at next? We've done the most or the must roster players. Let's take a look at blokes that maybe you don't have to roster. Get that garbage out of here. Number one on this list is Honoral Batim. <laughs> I'm joking. Um, these are guys that are rostered in a large chunk of leagues that I just don't think you need to do it. You don't have to hold them. You can. Again, a lot of this part of the season, 19 days left in the year, 17 game days left is about, what do I specifically need? I can't really imagine many of you sitting in 10 or 12 or even 14 team leagues going, man, I really need Buddy Healed. I need his 15 minutes a night. He's still rostered in 70% of leagues. 
Yes, he did start that game before, but like, what are we getting out of him? Although, to be fair, I think he played 30 minutes last game. I don't care. I don't think that this is a must-roster guy. Again, these are just guys, when they sit on your roster and they're at the back end, you go, eh, well, probably need them. I'm down in this category. Like, what do I do with Bud? Move on. That is where I'm talking about with these blokes. Same with PJ Washington. Was he solid enough yesterday? Interesting double-double with four threes? Absolutely. Did he do anything else? Absolutely not. Does he have a history of never doing anything consistently well? Absolutely, yes. So that is just a guy that we stream when we need, we move on when we need, and he is completely replaceable and completely usable at the same time. It's the duality of man. Jordy Clarkson, 68% rostered still. He came back from a one game for one game after his groin problem, and you wouldn't believe it, but struck down with back soreness immediately after that. The injury luck on this man is just... It's so unfortunate, and you really do feel sorry for the man on the street, J-O-R-D-A-N-C-L-A-R-K-S-O-N. It's been just a horrid run for him. The Ides of March are moving through the Northwest Division, and you can move on from Jordy Clarkson. I've got the horse, Keldon Johnson, here for a Category League drop. Keldon is okay at times. He's someone who has fooled people in the past, and he can be a points guy. Now he's also popping up. On the injury report is questionable. I just, there's no, we just don't need to do this in a category league. Jaden Ivey, not only has he been poor for most of this season, but now, even with guys out, we're seeing minutes push back for him. The horrific percentages, low defensive stats are hurting. And now he's also appearing on the injury report with knee soreness. As soon as I see a questionable knee soreness tag for a team that's tanking, they're not tanking. They're just bad. They don't want to be bad. They are not deliberately being bad. They are just horrific. But, um, in terms of that sort of a situation where they've deliberately been pushing his minutes down and now there's a questionable knee soreness tag on Jaden Ivey, well, you know, I, I, I'm just not doing it. I'm just not bothering holding him. Maybe he, last season when Cade was out, end of the season, he put up big numbers. This season, Cade's sort of in and out. I don't know if he's playing. Now we're getting Malachi Flynn out playing him and they're pulling Jaden Ivey's minutes back. Not interested. And the last one there is the big fella. It's Jonas Valanciunas. And yes, this is a longer view. Hold through Thursday, hold through Saturday, jack him all the way off after that. Get that garbage out of here. He plays like 11 minutes, 15 minutes a night. Like th- this is not even remotely close to being a rosterable guy. I was massively down on this guy heading into the season. He had a nice little stretch to begin the year, but this is exactly what I feared with him. And we play for the schedule. He is the same level of as Najee Marshall, Larry Nance, and Jose Alvarado at the moment. That is the level of play that Jonas Valanciunas is giving you. So you hold them while the low-volume games are on, and then you jack them all the way off after that. You don't hold them through that, and that's where Valanciunas sits. What about four points leagues? What am I talking about? I I'm, I'm I'm I keep forgetting whether I've hit the graphic or not. Get that garbage out of here! I think I did, but I also wanted to do it again because it's a good picture of um, self-branded hat legend Nick Nurse. Let's talk about droppable guys in points leagues. A lot of the similar names are here. Brooke Lopez, though, is at the top. Again... Like with Valanchunas, you hold through the quality game situation for Lopez and you stream him in, but in points leagues, what is he giving you? Like, is he giving you anything that suggests he needs to be rostered? They are managing his playing time. His production was bad to start the year, elite for about five weeks, mid for the rest, and now, honestly, it's bad most of the time. And in points leagues, we're talking 50, 60 spot difference between his actual points league value and category league value. And that means that he's not a rosterable points league guy. No, that's not true. He's not a must roster points league guy, which is what these players are. So when I say droppable, and I'm talking at a million miles an hour, when I say droppable, it's more like not must roster. It's not must drop. It's Again, it's a terminology, phraseology situation. It's not must drop, but it's not must roster. It means, yeah, you can jack but you don't have to. And I think that's where we're at with Brookie. I've got Bud Heald and Jordan Clarkson in there. Just talked about them on the category side. Exactly the same for the points. And I'm going with Mike Conley as well. Am I biased against old bastards? Maybe. I'm an old bastard too. But Conley does solid enough stuff in a category league. The assists are okay. He's very mid. The upside is low. But the assists are hard to find. In a points league, I just want points. I just want fantasy points. I want someone who gives me 27 fantasy points or 30 fantasy points. And if Conley gets me 23, then why do I hold him? I don't. You don't hold him. You move on. Same goes with Herb Jones. Category league value, really solid. But the value for him is a lot of in defensive stats and also the fact that he's shooting like 50% from three. That brings nice category value. But in a points league, if you get two steals and then 0-0, well, that inconsistency across a week 
gives you nothing. Like even at the moment with Ingram out and he's playing good minutes, what is he like 130th in points leagues? That is not a must roster guy when there's like two teams left in your league or four teams active in your league. You don't want to be holding on to the 130th best player because he's not good enough. See you later. And then if you want to go back onto old bastards, I don't think you need Chris Paul. He's playing 23 minutes a night. Not enough. Again, the assists are hyper-valuable in a category league because you can't find seven assists on the wire usually. Scoot Anderson, maybe. You can't really find it. But when Paul gets like six points, four rebounds, seven assists, two steals, that doesn't translate to good fantasy points. He's like, again, the 140th, 125th best player. That's not a must-roster guy at this point of the season in a cat, not a category, in a points league situation. What have the general populace been doing? In terms of who have they been adding off the waiver wire? Let's take a look. Over the last 24 to 48 hours, who has been added? You would have seen by that graphic, if you are double banging here on video, that Rashawn Holmes is up a massive 43%. I don't know what year this is, but that's where we're at. Holmes, we thought, hey, was there a chance he was going to be the starter in Dallas when they got him for free for the Kings? No, he just didn't play at all. He went over to uh, to Washington in the trade, didn't play. Bagley got hurt. Holmes got hurt. And then Bagley's back, and now Holmes is still playing 30 minutes a night. There is zero guarantee that Rashawn Holmes continues to play 30 minutes a night with Bagley back. There is zero guarantee that, honestly, we have, again, 19 days. I'll keep telling you, we've got 19 days left. There is zero guarantee that Holmes is even in the rotation for all of those days. They could say, well, let's see what Bagley and Vukcevic can do. Let's really tank it out and get Gil and Vukcevic to be our center rotation. Holmes, who's had a lot of injuries in his career. But at the moment, yeah, like he's rolling. I have very little confidence in where it goes from here, but for now, we go with it. The next most added player was Najee Marshall. You've already missed out on most of the value for Najee Marshall, the three and four nights, plus Tuesday's quality game. You've got two more left. He is totally reasonable to try for those two games, but a lot of the value in adding him is done. Juice McBride, 20%. Yes, as long as he plays 44 minutes, we go with it. And that's while OG is out. And while Precious Achua gets very... What is going to happen to Precious when Robinson comes back? I think Precious is a pretty clear jack, honestly. But Juice McBride, good numbers. Vit Krejci. Someone left a nickname for him over on Basketball, so they just called him David. I went like, David, what are we talking about? Then I remember the um, Bruins guy, David Krejci. I forgot that that name just was actually a good player in the NHL. Vit Krejci up 4,900. Why? Is Vic Krejci up? Well, there's the potential that DeJounte Murray is out, Trey is out, Kong is out, but the Hawks have the best schedule out of any team moving forward now. They've got their next six games, all quality games. Nobody has that. They play Thursday, Saturday, and then four qualities next week. Krejci had one good game, so there's a little bit of chasing involved in this, but that schedule is immense. And you'll say again, what do I care? Why don't I just get someone better? Because it enables you to just get plus three, plus four games up without wasting waiver moves. And using this guy on every single day that he plays next week, whereas you might add a better player, better player, PJ Washington, maybe somebody like that, who you might be able to use twice. And is that worth it? Is 120 minutes of Vic Krejci better than 70 minutes of PJ Washington? Sorry, PJ, I'm just using you the whole way. Or Bud Heald of 50 minutes of Bud Heald? Probably not. Oh, no, sorry. Is is 120 of Vic better than 50 of Bud? Probably yes. So again, it's all about the totality. He might have seven points, four rebounds, three assists in a game. And you go, what is the point of this? But with one ad across six games, it's 40 points, 30 rebounds, 25 assists, four steals, 12 threes. You don't really get that out of one waiver move. And yeah, you could always just cycle that through and get different guys in, but that's always going to depend on your roster construction, the amount of ads you've got, who you're adding, who you're dropping. But always in the standard sort of a setting where we're talking about four ads for a week, if you can plus max out plus four from one waiver spot with one move, it's a huge, huge advantage. People have also gone to DeAndre Hunter. He's up almost 3,400 ads in Yahoo. That's surprising to me that he was available in that many spots. Yes, he is the guy to add. Yes, he will have... 15, 1, and 0 with 0 steals and 0 blocks on 35%, or he'll have 24, 1, and 0 on 52%. We know what he does, but we know that the opportunity is there. And the other one is Peyton Pritchard, who is playing really well. They've got two quality games this week. We don't know about Drew. We don't know about Derek White. It sounds like Drew is coming back soon, but also the Celtics are so far up on everybody in the East and in the West, like six games up on Denver, I believe, in the West, that they don't have to play guys every single game. And they can just continue to sit White, Drew, Jalen, Jason, Al, Chris Stapps, six different blokes. They could all just sit randomly all through the rest of the year and Pritchard can run 27 minutes a night. 
and he's putting up really good numbers. So I get it. Adding him, the schedule works at the moment. The opportunity's there. The situation is perfect. So we can do that. Today's episode is brought to you by the Game Time app. When you want to buy tickets to an event, you shouldn't have to worry. It should be easy. It should be stress-free, in fact, because we're going to see something that is entertainment. We go to watch a sporting event, a live theater, comedy, a musical, because it's fun. Not because it's a chore, not because it's something where we just got to go and do it. It's because it's entertainment. So why should the process of getting these tickets be a complete pain continue? Well, with game time, no, no worries anymore. They've got everything sorted. They not only will give you the views from your seat, so you know what you're actually seeing. So when I am going across to that Padres game, I want to be seeing what, what view am I seeing? Where are my seats that I'm getting here from game time? How am I going to be able to get into the best position to make sure that I am getting the best viewing experience I can? They've got the flash deals. They send them to your phone. They go, hey, big fella, something going on tonight in your local area. Do you want to go down? We've got some discounted spots. And you go, yeah, absolutely. Can I have a look at what the tickets are? Yeah, well, you can. Of course you can. Here they are. And with game time, all in pricing. So the price you see is the price you pay. Transaction fees, processing fees, garbage fees, whatever. Um, pest removal, cleaning fees to clean the cleaners. None of that exists. It's all just the price you see is the price you get over at Game Time. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create the account, and use the code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. The terms apply. Again, create an account, redeem the code L O C K E D O N for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Some might say that lowest prices are just the beginning. All right. Let's go on to, we've looked at most added, and for some reason we're just running really slow, even though I'm talking at a million miles an hour. Who are the most dropped players? Get that garbage out of here. I've got to really adjust that. I don't know why that volume level is so weird on Jack's uh, voice. Apologies for that. Who are the most dropped players? Number one is the guy that I think shouldn't be, and that's Trace Jackson Davis. He's down 21%, and I get it. Like, once he sat out yesterday on that low-volume day, you do have to make that tough call. I, I, that is 100% reasonable. But part of the reason I was able to include him as a guy, Trace, to be a guy to must roster, is that everyone dropped him. Because I believe, even on high-volume days, that Trace is going to be startable. Assuming, assuming that we're in a situation where he is not, like, um, out for a week or so. I, I don't know that. In fact, he's currently questionable for Wednesday's game, so I don't know where he goes. From there, but if he's available, I'm adding him. Aaron Neesmith down 20%. Neesmith needs 36 minutes a night. He needs some real consistency in shooting and defensive stats to be must roster. He's injured. He's not do doing that consistently. See you later. Vasily Misic. People got really upset about him scoring two points, didn't they? Like, I've told you this a million times. A lot of the reactive moves and part of the way maybe you can insulate yourself against reactivity is don't just add someone because they scored a lot or don't just drop someone because they didn't score a lot. Misic still got four assists, still played 30 minutes. Yeah, it was a weirdly low usage game and he didn't shoot. And I've got no problem if you want to drop him. But as a wholesale drop, I don't think that that needed to be there. Keon Ellis dropped as well. Everywhere. 5,000 drops. Now, I'm going to guess if you added Keon, you did it for defensive stats. And it's annoying that he didn't get defensive stats yesterday. Or you added him for the back-to-back. -back. He still played 28 minutes. And in one of his last three games, he was massive. The other two, not so much. I do get dropping him, but he has to be in the conversation, Keon Ellis, as a perfect stream guy or potential must roster guy. Najee Marshall got dropped in a lot of spots. He was the most added player according to our basketball monster metric, and people dropped him after yesterday. I'll, I'll say this, and I apologize is if this is you. That's idiotic if you drop Najee Marshall. Why would you have dropped him after yesterday? Idiotic. The reason that you added Najee Marshall, the only reason you added Najee Marshall, the only reason was to get the three quality games in a row. So you drop him after one, you just wasted an ad. There was, he was not the best ad for Tuesday. An absolute waste of an ad. A, a, a terrible decision. It's a, Again, if he, you were disappointed his Tuesday production, dropping him now, does not that, doesn't that wipe that off your team? You don't think, well, I'll just take league average instead. It's a terrible... Uh, maybe you push back on this. If you think it is a good decision to drop Najee Marshall, please let me know down below. Please let me know if why you think that's a good idea. Because I know that someone will say, well, yeah, now I can just switch him out for Peyton Pritchard and get two Celtics games. If that was the case, then Marshall wasn't the guy to add for Tuesday. You added a better streaming guy on Tuesday because you could have got someone, if you knew it was just for one game, you could have just got somebody. But you're not getting any benefit, I don't think, from dropping him. 
That is an owl. Spencer didn't drop. Yeah, cool. He's bad. Um, he had that one big game, which congratulations to that one you were championship or got you through to the playoffs or the finals or whatever. It was just completely out of nowhere. And I don't think that we need to care too much about that. What about the guys who are hot? Happy birthday. The yokai himself, John Isaac. These are guys that I haven't mentioned yet who are top 100 over the last week. And one of them is the big fella, Johnny Isaac, who is just putting up unbelievably good numbers. The problem I have here with Isaac is that they play a back-to-back on the weekend and Isaac's participation in back-to-backs has been spotty. And I say that and you might think that I'm taking the piss, but I'm not, or I'm the being sarcastic and I'm not because he has missed one game. of the. And when we say missing back-to-backs, we don't mean both games. We mean one game always. So he has missed back-to-backs. He has played back-to-backs. He's also half played back-to-backs where he'd play one game and then play seven minutes in the next one. So I have no idea, and, and it's not a pattern. It's not like he missed the back-to-backs, then he played the seven-minute back-to-backs, then he played 20 minutes on both nights. It's all over the place. So I don't know what he's going to do Friday, Saturday. We want him to play on Saturday when there's no games on, basically. But that's a Friday, Saturday, back-to-back. So Isaac is putting up good numbers. And honestly, you might even start him on Wednesday and Friday, even with the bulk games on. But the worry you have is the real jewel in adding John Isaac is Saturday. And, and I don't know what we get. Jacques Landale is one of the top 100 players, largely because there was that the seven-block game in there, I think, but also the big game without Jabari Smith. And we're going to see again today, Jabari's back. Landale goes into a more iffy spot. Not sure he's an ad. This guy, Big Dick Dick Richards, I don't think he's topped 50% all season in terms of rostered, even though Mark Williams has been out since November. Let's just throw it, let's make that a more American reference. I think Mark Williams has been out since Thanksgiving. And he just does the thing all the way through. Is he top 100 all the time? No, but he definitely should be on more rosters more of the time. And yeah, he should be rostered. Norman Powell's been pretty good at the moment. I don't look at that as anything more than a stream for points and threes. Sam Hauser, he just copy and paste what I said about Pritchard, except he's a worse player than Pritchard, I think, and less categorical value because he doesn't get the assists. But Hauser is going to have lots of opportunities with the Celtics. Um, definitely not load managing. Everyone's got a legitimate injury all this period, and they only last one game at a time, and they're only for specific players, and the only two guys can get hurt at once. They're just, it, it just it's the way it works out. I don't know. I, I don't make I don't make any of these rules up, but the universe just smiles down on everyone from Boston because they love um, everyone there. That's probably why. The last name on this list, and I was surprised at this, but Alexei Pokrashevsky, Alexei Pokrashevsky is a top 100 player over the last week. And I was like, hmm, that's um, a little interesting. I don't... <sighs> Schedule will be important here for Poku. I, I don't hate that. We know that he's got a fantasy-friendly game. More of The reason that I've been hesitant on him is like, will he actually play enough? And we saw last game he played over Davis Bertans, more minutes than Davis Bertans. So I'm a little interested in this. Not massively interested, a little interested. Hmm. What about injury replacement guys? Who, and a lot of these guys we're talking about already are, as you're well aware, but we're just putting these into a separate category, a little bit more deeper stuff. Maybe one game streams, maybe not. Who's getting the bump? Well, Marcus Sasser. I could also throw Malachi Flynn in there because Sasser has been outplayed by Flynn. Uh, Who's older out of those two? It's going to be pretty close. Um, Sasser has now got Cade maybe missing, Ivy maybe missing. 30 minutes a night, maybe coming here from Sasa. I would say it's pretty likely he averages 30 minutes a night from here on out. You probably get bad shooting, but you might get six assists with one and a half steals. That's useful enough. 1% rostered legend Jared Butler is going to have opportunities because Tyus Jones, I fear, is done. I don't know how long Jordan Poole plays. If you were in the position to be getting ahead of it, or in a slightly deeper format, Butler's your man. Don't be shocked if you get one to two double-digit assist games with some decent scoring and shooting. This is a very fantasy-friendly player who might actually get a 10-8 game opportunity here to put up numbers. Tyus, I fear, is done. Poole, I think, will be done soon. And then you're going to get full Butler. Delano Banton. I don't know if Simons is coming back. I don't believe that he is. I don't believe that Brogdon is. And I'm 50-50 on Sharp coming back. Banton racks up numbers. Now, he can very easily Karis Levert you at any point. And if you don't know what getting Karis Levert it is, just go and roster Karis Levert and see what happens to your field goals and free throws. Banton can do that. But he's playing 38 minutes. He racks up counting stats. We're in on him. His teammate, Jabari Walker, 
I don't know whether the Ides of March and Jeremy Grant, I don't know, maybe he gets uh, resurrected at Easter. Who knows what happens to Jeremy? But Jabari Walker, I think at some point he's going to be 12-team worthy, so we're keeping an eye on that. Bruno Fernando, as long as Onyeka Okongwu is out, Fernando's got a little bit of value as a backup, rebound, blocks, field goal percentage guy. Some nights he'll outplay Clint Capella. We've seen that happen many times as well. And the last name on this list is one that's a little iffy. It's 10-day legend Shemezi Metu, who had uh, like what, 18 minutes in his first game, 36 in the next one, 19 in the next one. If Monty Williams doesn't know what he's doing in the next moment, neither do we. But we've got to at least pay a little bit of attention to Shemezi because he's a much better fantasy player than old mate Tosan Ebbelman. And if he gets 30 minutes somehow out of nowhere, then we're interested. I don't know that Simone Fontecchio is coming back. I know Stewart's not. I know Asar Thompson's not. And I'm going to guess that Simone maybe isn't. I'm going to guess that Simone maybe isn't. And they'll say, we're going to sign you to a restricted free agent contract because we're going to overpay you because we've got the worst GM in the league. They probably don't say that part. That's implied. But I don't know that Fontecchio is going to be out there going. Very similar to the way that certain teams may have allegedly acted in the past. Portland, I'm looking at you in showing down Yusuf Nurkic and promising him a contract. I'm looking at, no, maybe, I don't know. But with Fontecchio, I think that might end up happening. And that means there's an opportunity there for uh, Chemezi Metu. Let's lastly look at a bunch of other names that we do need to talk about. And we are going to head back to Portland when talking other names because I do think it is worth talking about Tamani Kamara, who's been starting for most of the season. He's been relatively fantasy useless for most of the season, but we're seeing a little bit creep in here. Some increased rebounds, some increased defensive stats, and when eventually all of the guys who can actually do anything offensively go away, one to two more shots, three more shots, go his way. 13 and 6, steal, block. It's very much not exciting. It's very much not high upside. He's very much not a must roster guy, but he's at least on our radar here. I think we've got to look at Scott Pippen as well. Trying to figure out what's going on in Memphis is a fool's errand. Is Goodwin going to play? Canard going to play? Conchard going to play? Bang going to play? Smart going to play? I've got absolutely no idea. Game by game. But what I do know is that if Pippen starts, he's a 12 team league player. So we're sort of banking on no smart. Limited Concha, limited Canard. Goodwin, obviously limited. It's just hard to trust, though, man. Dwap Reith, that's an easy one. Aiton's out, or has been out, and we roll with Reith. We don't expect Aiton to play every game rest of the season. We just don't know how many he's going to play, so Reith is there. I'll just keep throwing Grady Dick at you, because if there's anything I know you guys love, it's receiving Dick advice in terms of fantasy. So... Grady has had big opportunity, and we said this weeks ago. Well, I said it. Maybe you echoed it. Maybe you argued. And I said, I think we're going to get 30 minutes of dick. Part of that's a joke, but it was also 100% serious that we are going to get 30 minutes of dick every night here the rest of the way, and we are. The problem is, is that dick is just not shooting well. Like, he is sometimes getting you 30%, sometimes 50%. You just can't rely on dick at this point. We have to keep him in mind, though, because I don't... Well, quickly and Barrett might return, but I don't think they're going to marginalize dick through this period, he is their future. Like, the Raptors' future, honestly, it's Scott Barnes, he's not coming back. It's quickly. And it's Dick. They need, they need Dick to work out. So I think we're going to see okay minutes. Now, whether it works out for him this season, it probably doesn't. And, you know, in the end, does he turn into a Corey Kispert level uh, mid-bench shooter? Very, very possible. But I think we're going to get opportunities to see it. And if there's one thing we want to see, it's Dick. The Sandwich, Patrick Baldwin Jr. You've noticed I've talked about quite a lot of Wizards and Blazers guys because they're in the we're sitting a lot of blokes down phase. Avdia, Kuzma, um, uh, Jones, maybe Poole. And the Sandwich, Patty Baldwin, has a fantasy-friendly game. And what do I mean by a fantasy-friendly game? It's more for categories than points. A points league guy is a high-usage scorer. That is a points league fantasy-friendly game. A category league guy is a guy like this who can sh- who can shoot, allegedly, who will shoot, definitely, who can sometimes score, who can rebound, who can block shots, who's not a terrible free-throw shooter. He could just add, like he is, think Puzingas. He's not Puzingas, but he can do the things that Puzingas does in smaller quantities. And if the sandwich gets to start, if Kuzma's shoulder becomes unbearable, well, Baldwin will play 30 minutes. There'll be nights where he has seven points on 22% shooting. But there'll be nights where he goes 15 and nine with three blocks and three triples. And that is bloody useful. The last name there is one that I don't know how much we see or if we see it at all. And that is Jarris Walker. Hello. Jarris was great with Neesmith out last game. I thought that Jarris's role in the NBA would probably be at the four with some small ball five. 
but they don't have any opportunity for him really at the four or the five. And with Siakam and Turner locked in, they are trying him at the three, and it's working all right. He can block shots, he can steal, he can pass. The shooting is horrific. But we saw him play 29 minutes last game without Neesmith. Now, I don't think that he's necessarily going to even be in the rotation each night. But he might be. And we need to see where this goes because it was very encouraging. So we're at least keeping Jarris Walker's name on our mind. And that is the end of a Rambly Waiver Wire show. I will be back later on today with the streaming show for Thursday. For Thursday. So stick around. Thumb it up. Ring the bell. Notifications. And leave your comments down below. Tell me your thoughts on Hats in Turkey and tell me your thoughts on fantasy basketball as well. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.